Okay. Right, yeah, so first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, and like Martin said, uh, so I'm a postdoc at the University of Leeds in the maths department. Um, and I've just finished my PhD there a couple of months ago. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, the topic that really was the main substance of my PhD, and that was looking at this uh, bacteria, Francisella tularensis. Um, so just to give an overview of what the talk's going to be like, so, uh, so maybe not many people have heard of Francisella tularensis, uh, so I'll give an introduction to that and perhaps why we should study it. Um, and then, so the second part will be looking at the, the intracellular life cycle, so I'll talk about two methods that we've done to actually model this. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's going to take what we know from the intracellular life cycle and apply this to some within host modeling um, of infection in the lung or starting off in the lung and then how it disseminates to other organs. Um, and yeah, and so we'll do some, uh, some parameter inform inference and some sensitivity analysis as well at the end. Uh, so starting off with, uh, so what is Francisella tularensis? Uh, so it's a gram-negative bacteria, uh, and it causes the disease tularemia. And so one of the, the striking features of this bacteria is how infectious it is. So it can cause tularemia, uh, which can be quite a severe disease with as few as 10 colony-forming units in humans. And this can be right down to just a single colony-forming unit in mice. Um, so most reported uh, infections are acquired through the skin. So uh, say like a tick bite, so uh, there may be an infected hare or rabbit, and then the tick would uh, pass that on from the hare uh, to the human. But actually, uh, this form of tularemia isn't that severe, uh, and it's generally treatable with antibiotics, uh, so it's not too much of a worry. Um, the most dangerous kind of tularemia is when you inhale the bacteria. So we've got these pictures of these, these ticks and stuff, and hairs over here, but we also have this picture of a lawnmower, which might seem a bit odd. Um, but when people talk about uh, Francisella tularensis, they usually uh, refer to this story, um, where there was a guy in the US who was, he was out mowing, mowing his lawn, uh, and what he didn't realize is that there was a, a dead rabbit in front of him, and he mowed over the, the dead rabbit and chopped it up. Um, and what he didn't realize is that the rabbit was infected with the Francisella tularensis bacteria, so all of those bacteria got, got put into the air. He ended up inhaling the bacteria um, and then developed tularemia. Uh, so actually when you go on, uh, so this is from the, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and when you go on their website for tularemia, uh, they'll say things like, if you want to avoid getting it, you should avoid contact with rabbits and you should use insect spray, but actually they also say you should avoid running over dead animals with your lawnmower. Um, so yeah, so this, this kind of inhalational tularemia is what we're really interested in. Um, and so without treatment, the fatality, fatality rate is around 30%. And again, it is treatable with antibiotics. Um, but even in about 2% of cases, uh, the infection will still be fatal. Um, and currently, there's no licensed vaccine. So there is a strain called uh, well, the live vaccine strain, LVS which is one of the most well-studied uh, strains of Francella tularensis. Um, it's not a licensed vaccine because they're still not entirely sure about the, the mechanisms of its attenuation. And also, it's, it's not completely effective um, in this most severe case where you, where you inhale bacteria. Um, so I should say now as well that so this work was linked with the, the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory in the UK. Um, and so their role is really just to do all the research and development uh, for the military of defense. Um, so you might be thinking, why would they be interested in this bacteria, particularly for the role of defense? Um, so the main reason is that it's previously been used as a bioterrorism agent, or sorry, not bioterrorism, bio, bio threat agent. And it was, it was previously developed into a biological weapon. Um, and so much so that the, the US were worried about it. So uh, sort of through from the 50s to the 70s, they had this, this program called Operation White Coat, um, where they would have these volunteers uh, that would become inf 
they would infect them with the bacteria. They have this, this huge sphere over here. It's called like a test sphere. And it's this huge sort of four-story high sphere. And what they would do is they'd put these biological weapons into the sphere, and occasionally with animals as well, and they would detonate these weapons just to see the effects uh, of the bacteria on the animals. But then also you can see here you have these people. Uh, so these would be the volunteers, and here are some of them here. And they would just position themselves at ports all around the edge of this sphere, and then just sit there and inhale the bacteria um, from the biological weapon that had been detonated inside. Uh, and generally, so they were interested in looking at the dose-dependent dose effects. Um, so right down to inhaling just a few bacteria, but some of these people were inhaling tens of thousands of bacteria. And so you'd, you'd get a quite a severe disease. Um, they were all treated, though, because they were really just looking at, um, yeah, how, how, uh, yeah, how the dose-dependent effects and how that affects their ability to work and fever and temperature. Uh, but yeah, they were all treated with antibiotics. And so collectively, with all this information, so previously been used uh, in biological weapons or implemented in biological weapons, um, and the low infectious dose, that 10 colony forming units that you need for infection, this has resulted in French cellar being classified as a, a category A bioterrorism agent by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So this is the, the top tier of biological agents. And so for DSTL, the, uh, the interest is in looking at how we can model this bacteria, particularly at these low initial doses, and then also the early stages of infection as well. So if you suppose you were one of these people that was sitting around, uh, around the edge of this big sphere inhaling the bacteria, um, what might happen to you? So, so you'd inhale the bacteria, and to begin with, it would go to your lungs, uh, and the, primarily it would infect alveolar macrophages. And so this is where we can start looking at the intracellular life cycle. So it would get taken up, and then initially it would be contained in some kind of phagosome. Um, but before this phagosome can mature into lysosomes and uh, kill the bacteria, um, it managed to, manages to escape. So generally after about half an hour to an hour, the bacterium has escaped from the phagosome, and it's just residing in the cytosol. And then it's got a number of mechanisms that it uses to make sure it gets all the nutrients it needs to replicate, and it can replicate to quite high numbers. And then ultimately what you get is uh, the death of the cell, and then the release of all these, and it could be potentially hundreds of bacteria uh, being released from this cell. And they'll go on and infect other cells and disseminate um, to other organs around the body. Uh, and generally, uh, with francella infection, so sometimes it's referred to as a stealth pathogen. So it will be undetected by the immune response for, can be up to 72 hours. And then what you just get is this surge in a pro-inflammatory response, which is just too much and too late. Um, yeah. So, so we've got an idea of the intracellular life cycle of this bacteria. So now we can think about um, some approaches that we could use to model this. And so I'm going to start off with some approaches that wouldn't be so good, just because of the nature of this bacteria. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we can see this, what might be quite a common model in sort of uh, viral dynamics, um, but it's sometimes used for bacterial infections as well. So you might have some, some target cells, T, um, and these can get infected with rate beta uh, by, by the bacteria. And then when these target cells become infected, they become infected cells, um, and so they'll survive for some period of uh, length tau i. And then when you look at the, the equation for the bacteria, so we've got this loss due to infection, we might have some loss due to death, but then we also have this production term, which is proportional to the, the number of infected cells that you have. And so the problem is here, so if you think about solving this system of ODEs, as soon as you get uh, any kind of infected cell, you're going to get some kind of release of bacteria. Okay, but that doesn't really make sense for Francisella because it's not like a virus that is being continuously released from the cell. What happens is the bacteria will go into the cell and then there'll be some period of maybe, well, at least 24 hours 
and then the cell will rupture or burst, and then you'll get the release of bacteria. So it's not this continuous increase of bacteria that you would see here. It's sort of a discrete event where you get no bacteria, and then suddenly you have hundreds. So there are times when this assumption might be okay, uh, and that would be if we had lots of cells and their time of infection was staggered. So then you can imagine that these rupture events are almost happening continuously, and then you almost have a continuous release of bacteria. But our interest here is looking at the early stages of infection, and particularly at the, the low infectious doses. So generally, we don't have a lot of infected cells, and they're all going to be infected at approximately the same time. Uh, so we don't really want to use an approach like this. So then you could say that maybe we want to look at the, the intracellular dynamics. So this is a model um, by some people at Public Health England. So they're next door to DSTL. They work on some similar agents, but uh, with respect to looking at, um, at public health as opposed to the military of defense. So here, this is an intracellular model for the, the replication. So you might assume that we have some delay uh, where the bacteria is escaping the phagosome and the population just stays constant. But then after that, you have some logistic growth process. So here, C would be a carrying capacity, and this W would be that initial rate of exponential growth of the population. Uh, so you could assume that you could model your intracellular dynamics like this. The problem with this is that what they then do is they say, well, how many bacteria are going to be released from a cell when it ruptures? Well, we'll just say, what's the medium time until rupture? And we'll evaluate our function at that time. So they get a single value for the number of bacteria that are being released. And the problem with this is that that's not really going to happen. So some uh, cells might rupture with just a few bacteria, and some might rupture with a few hundred. And if you're thinking about the case where we're at low infectious doses, and suppose you just had one bacteria. So that bacteria might go into the cell. In this case, that cell is then going to release a few hundred bacteria, and it's pretty unlikely that the infection will be eliminated. Um, so in that case, you've really just got the probability of elimination is just the probability that that initial bacteria dies before it goes into the cell. What we could do instead, um, and what we've shown in a few slides, is that if you actually find the distribution of bacteria that are released, then you can say that that probability of, of elimination is the probability that uh, that initial bacteria doesn't go in the cell, plus the probability that it does go in the cell, but you only have a few bacteria released, so then that, those bacteria could be eliminated as well. Uh, so that's the approach that we're going to try and adopt. So we're going to base it around this model, this intracellular model, but actually uh, characterize the whole distribution of the rupture size. So yeah, yeah, so that should be, so these are two deterministic approaches. So we're going to try and stay away from these deterministic approaches and stick with this uh, stochastic intracellular model. So the idea of our model is that we're going to have some cell that's going to be infected uh, with a bacterium. So the bacterium is just the orange rod here. Um, and this bacterium can replicate within the cells, so we'll move up through the, the states, so from state one to state two to state three. Um, and then you could also have elimination of bacteria and the cell recovering. So in this case, we go to this absorbing state zero here. But then we want to uh, incorporate the bursting of the cell as well. So we're going to include this state B as well. So this is the bursting or the rupture of the cell and the release of the bacteria. Um, and we're going to assume that you can enter this state from any, any of the other states. So you can release any number of bacteria uh, when the cell ruptures. So yeah, we're going to mark, model this as a Markov process, where X of T is counting the number of bacteria in the cytosol. So I should say as well, we're just going to temporarily ignore the period where the bacterium isn't at the phagosome, but we'll come back to that later. Um, and so we're going to consider two scenarios. The first scenario we're going to consider is when you assume the distribution of the time until rupture. Um, and the second one is where we're going to use these rates, so the betas and the mu's and the deltas, to actually derive what would be the distribution. Um, and so in both cases, we're interested in the time until rupture. Of course, in the first case, this is just given because we're assuming a distribution. Uh, and in the second case, we'll find it. But we're also interested in how many bacteria are being released. So. If we look at the first case, where we assume a distribution, 
So there's been some uh, in vitro experimental work uh, that measured this release of this enzyme LDH, which is an indicator of membrane disruption. Um, and some people, again, at Public Health England did some fitting to this data and showed that the, the distribution of rupture times followed this log normal distribution. And so what we can think of this as is like a, a clock, a rupture clock that's ticking on the time until rupture. So you can imagine if you were simulating this process, you would just have this birth and death process going on, and you would sample a time from your log normal distribution. You would just run that birth and death process, and as soon as you got to that time, your process is going to stop, and then whichever state that's in, that's how many bacteria are going to be released. The problem is, is that this log normal distribution means that our process is no longer Markovian. So for Markovian processes, we have to have this memoryless property, these exponential waiting times. But of course, our clock is ticking right from when we uh, start in state one. And so if we're in state four or five or something, we need to remember where that clock is. So we don't have this memoryless property. Um, so how can, we, how can we resolve this issue? So the, the approach we use is to consider phase type distributions. Um, so the phase type distribution is just uh, really a generalization. It's a family of distributions and a generalization of the exponential distribution. So you can define it as the time to absorption of an absorbing, absorbing Markov process. And so the simplest case is just if you have one, one state here and one state here, and you have one transition into the other, or well, the second state is your absorbing state, and we know that the, the, uh, the time to go between them is an exponential random variable. So your exponential distribution is your simplest case of a phase type. So you can extend that a bit further. So if you imagine you had a sequence of states, but still just one single absorbing state at the end, if you have the same rate going between every state, then again, you've, you're just looking at the time until absorption of this Markov chain. Um, and we know that that's just going to be a sum of exponential random variables that time. And so in that case, uh, you've got an Erlang distribution. So the Erlang distribution is, a, is another type of phase type distribution. Um, and so then you can start thinking, well, if I just pick any arbitrary number of states and I can define any, all the transition rates between them, maybe I can actually approximate any distribution. And so that's true. So you can approximate any non-negative real distribution by a phase type distribution. Um, and so that's essentially what we're going to do here. So here's our log normal distribution. And we're just going to use, uh, so actually, a, a statistical package in R, which is going to choose essentially everything for us. Um, so this is going to be a, the auxiliary process that we're going to have. So we're going to have eight states in total. And then again, leading into this same rupture state that we saw in the previous diagram. Um, and so it's going to choose all of these transition rates. It actually doesn't consider any kind of structure. Um, the package that we're using considers uh, processes of the form of uh, Erlang Coxian distributions, which have this kind of structure where you have a, a sequence of states like an Erlang and then a two-stage two Coxian distribution at the end. Um, and they consider these just so you're not searching, well, just so you don't have too many parameters. Because you can imagine if you pick n states, then, and you have to estimate the transition rates of your generator matrix, then you've got n squared parameters to estimate. So they consider these sort of slightly simpler structures just so we reduce the number of parameters. But yeah, this R package picks everything for us. So we pick the eight states, it will pick our, our generator matrix, and it will also tell us our initial uh, probability vector. And so if we sample from this phase type distribution here, or the approximation, you can see that it, it compares well to the log normal distribution that we're using. So the idea is that, um, let me just go back. So here we've got our, our birth and death process. And here we've got our process that is acting like our rupture clock. So now all we need to do is just combine the two processes. So when you do that, you just get this bivariate Markov process, where you can imagine if you're moving along a row, this is like our birth and death process. And then as you're coming down the columns, this is like our rupture clock. So if you take, just look at one column, that would be the same process that we saw on the previous slide. And then the rows are just the birth and death process that we saw two slides back. 
Um, and so this bivariate process has a nice form as well. So this is a quasi-birth death process, which makes it slightly simpler to analyze. Um, and essentially what that means is if we group the states into levels where we consider a column as a level, you can only move within a column or between adjacent columns. So in that sense, it's a bit like a, a birth and death process. Um, and so if we want to know how many bacteria are being released when this cell ruptures, all we need to do is look at which level or which column we're entering state V from. Uh, so you can use first step analysis to get this. And then, so here, you can do this for, for general rates. This plot here is showing you if you had a stochastic logistic growth process um, as your, so if you define your betas and your mu's, so you have a stochastic logistic growth process, uh, you will get a distribution like this, so you get this bimodal shape, uh, where it's possible to release just a few bacteria on rupture, or you could release a few hundred. Um, and so one, one downside of this approach is that the rupture clock is not linked to the birth and death process. So they're correlated in the sense that if you have larger or longer rupture times, you'll have more bacteria. Um, but if we were to change, say, the birth rate in our birth and death process, at the moment that will have no effect on the time until rupture, um, which might not seem completely true. You might expect that if the bacteria is replicating faster, then maybe this cell's uh, going to die quicker. So then what we can try to do instead is try to actually derive the time until rupture and how many bacteria that are being released um, from these birth, death, and rupture rates. So if we, well, so the first way we can do this is to think about uh, the survival function um, of a macrophage. So if we define this S uh, to be the probability that an infected macrophage survives to time t, and so this is given that it's infected with K bacteria at the start, uh, then first of all, we know so we get this nice property. So if you, if you take the survival function given that you're infected with K, bacteria, then this is the same as the survival function given you're infected uh, with one bacteria to the power of K. Um, and this is because, so if we think about a cell containing K bacteria, we can think of this as K cells, each containing one bacteria. Um, and these cells are all independent up until that time of rupture. And because we're only interested up, in, up until that time of rupture, we can treat all of those cells independently. And so we get this nice property here. And so when we want to, to get the survival function, we can say, well, let's consider what happens uh, in a short interval of length delta t. And then we'll go on to look at what's happening between that interval delta t to t plus delta t. So if we start off with k, k bacteria in our cell, so what could we have at uh, time delta t? Well, we could have k plus 1 with probability b to k delta t. Uh, we could have k minus 1 with probability mu k delta t. Uh, we could go into the rupture state uh, with this rate, or we could have nothing happening at all. Um, and so you can use that to then consider, so if we have k plus 1 bacteria, uh, our survival function is then s k plus 1 of t, and then it's the same for the remaining terms. Of course, if we go into the, into the rupture state, we've got no chance of surviving. And so you can... Uh, yeah, so you can formulate this ODE here uh, for your survival function. Um, and because we have this property here, that the, if you just take the kth power, um, you get SK of T, we actually only need to solve this for K equals 1. And in that case, you'll just get a quadratic on this right-hand side. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward to solve this survival function. So... So actually get the, uh, the density of the time into ruptures. So this is equivalent to our log normal distribution uh, from a few slides back. So we can either just take the derivative of the survival function, or we can formulate it in this way. Uh, so if we consider a population of n macrophages, and they each have x1, uh, so they're each infected with one bacteria, I'm sorry. Um, and we think about how many cells are going to die, again, in a short interval of length delta t. Uh, so we know that each one will rupture with rate delta, uh, so delta xi delta t. Um, and so if we, if we divide by delta t, then we recognize this left-hand side as being the derivative of the survival function. And so we just get this expression here. So we can say that our density 
uh, of rupture times is just delta times the mean of our birth and death process. Um, and so here, here, this is the plot. So on the left-hand side, what I'm plotting here is the polynomial that you get. Uh, so this polynomial down here, just for the case k equals 1, um, because if you're considering a birth and death process with catastrophe, so we've got some death of intracellular bacteria, uh, then you'll get this root here, A, um, has some importance. So that will be the probability that the cell will ultimately survive. So your survival function in the case here, uh, when mu is not equal to zero, will tend to this, this limit A. And of course, when, uh, yeah, when mu is equal to zero, so you've got no death, then your process will always rupture. So your macrophage is always going to die. So in this sense, we've got the, the time until rupture. So now what we want to look at is how many bacteria are being released. So for this, we can then, we can again think of it uh, sort of in simpler terms. So if we think about a, uh, so a cell that contains N bacterium, so the rate of rupture is just going to be delta times N. And we know that that, um, so yeah, delta times N, and we know that the number of bacteria released would then be N as well. And so if we sum over uh, all the possibilities of that state N, then we see that this function that's describing the, the release of bacteria through time is actually just related to the second moment of our process. So the first moment of our process is used for the, the time until rupture, and the second moment is used for the number of released. And also you can write this as, as just the product of that density of the time until rupture times by some function, N bar we're calling it here, so M bar would be like saying, well, given this cell's rupturing at time t, how many bacteria is it going to release? Um, and so if we wanted to look at the, the average number of bacteria being released or the distribution, so for the mean, we can just integrate over all the times for this average. Uh, and we get this expression here. So 1 minus A, you can just recognize as the, if A is the probability that the cell ultimately survives, 1 minus A is the probability that will ultimately rupture. And so given that it ruptures, B over B minus 1 is then telling us the average size of that rupture. And so that's quite nice because now we have uh, both of these roots of this uh, quadratic have some importance. And if you want, yeah, so in this case, if you want to look at the whole distribution of the rupture size, uh, here it will be geometric. So now, We've looked at two approaches where you can sort of characterize the intracellular dynamics by looking at both the time until rupture and how many bacteria are being released. So now we're going to take that second approach because it was slightly nicer because we're not having these independent uh, rupture clock and uh, birth and death process. We're going to uh, use that to help us model the within host dynamics. So. So this is all based around um, some data provided to us by DSTL. So this was an uh, in vivo study uh, where they infected mice at so a low, medium, um, and high initial dose. And they measured uh, at various time points in the first 48 hours the bacterial loads in a range of organs. So we've got the lung, liver, kidney, spleen, and lymph node. And so if we look at the data down here, so there's not many points uh, for the low initial doses. So I'm only pl plotting positive values here. So in this case, um, a lot of the mice showed no signs of infection in lots of the organs. When we move up to the, uh, the medium dose, uh, we're seeing like a, a steady increase in the lung um, and then also in the lymph node towards the end. And then also we see the same pattern in the, in the high dose data. Uh, so you get a lot of bacteria in the lung because this is where uh, the infection is starting. Um, but then the second organ really to become infected uh, looks to be the lymph node. And then you sort of have this collection of dots down here for the liver, spleen, and kidney. So the idea is that we want to try and use, um, we want to try and model this replication of the bacteria uh, inside cells within the lung. And then also it's spread between the organs where they measure the bacterial counts. So then we can try and infer those model parameters given this data. So the way that we tried to set this up to begin with was with an agent-based model. Um, so here's, this is a depiction of the model, and the agents would just be 
uh, so bacteria and macrophages. And so the nice thing with agent-based modeling is that you just have objects and you define attributes for each of those objects and you define some rules for those objects and then you just simulate it um, and then you can look at the behavior. So for the bacteria, we define some locations. So this would just be the organ that they're currently in. We also have a location of an intracellular compartment. Um, so this would be whether they're in the phagosome or the cytosol. Uh, and then we have this idea of a cohort number, which is important for when we come uh, to the uh, next slides. So the idea of this is that it's roughly going to be how many uh, cells a single bacterium has infected. So that initial dose of bacteria that come into the lung, they would all have cohort number of zero. As soon as they enter a cell, that cohort number would increase to one. And then we're also going to make the assumption that bacteria inherit from the parent. So then all those bacteria uh, that are released in that first rupture event, that first rupturing macrophage, um, they would all have uh, cohort number one, so that then when they infect more cells, that would go up to two. And so this is just our way of, of tracking, um, yeah, tracking the uh, progression. And then so we also have, for macrophages, we have the, the same location attribute as well for the bacteria. Um, we have a list of, of the bacteria that are contained within the cell. Again, we have a cohort number, but this is so we can uh, classify the, the rupture event, whether it's like a, a cohort one rupture event, i.e., um, the bacterium that first infected it was a cohort one bacterium. Uh, and then also we have this idea of an activation state. Uh, so here we're assuming that um, macrophages would start off thing. If they become infected, they enter this suppressed state and they would um, secrete TGF beta. And then, uh, so then it would go through the, um, the intracellular life cycle and then when it bursts, uh, so the release of damps and pamps might activate neighboring uh, macrophages. So we also have this, this red state here uh, would be activated macrophages. These would also uh, release the cytokine interferon gamma, and that would help activate more macrophages. And so the idea would be here that your activated macrophages would be able to eliminate the bacteria that they take up. Um, and so... Yeah, so, so we have a, uh, objects for the bacterium and the macrophages, but for the ODEs, it makes sense to just treat these as continuous random variables. So we have these ODEs describing them here for, for interferon gamma and TGF beta. Uh, generally, for, for Francisella tularensis infection, we don't see much uh, increase in interferon gamma until day three. So for the time being, although all of this activation stuff is in the model, we're just going to put it to one side and really just focus on the replication of the bacteria inside the cells, um, their bursting and their dissemination around. So we're not going to focus too much on this, on this activation. Uh, so when we look at the reactions that we define for agent-based models, so we've got phagocytosis, um, so bacteria entering the cells. We have phagosomal escape, intracellular replication, the rupture. Um, so we're also going to account for extracellular bacterial death. And then this term, so this is migration from the lung to another organ. And so we're going to have weights on each of those organs as well um, that will determine how likely it is, given that it's leaving the lung, how likely it is to go to each organ. Um, and then we also have this, this activation and suppression of macrophages. But again, this isn't, this isn't the focus here. So our, our agent-based model, you can use Gillespie and Tau Leaping uh, time-stepping. So Gillespie is the, the exact method, and Tau Leaping is this approximative method where you just take um, sort of fixed time-step, uh, whereas here you're using uh, the rates to determine the time-step. And then we're going to suppose that you have some initial state where you have M uninfected resting macrophages and some initial dose of N bacteria. So if we want to model the populations of bacteria uh, in these organs, uh, we're going to use this idea of the cohort analysis. So I've mentioned what the cohort number is. Uh, so then we can define these variables here. So we're going to let PN be the number of uh, phagosomal bacteria with cohort number N. And similarly, CN is the number of cytosolic bacteria with cohort number N. And so now we can just work through the cohort. So the cohort one is really that uh, initial dose of bacteria that are in the cells. Uh, 
uh, cohort two would be uh, the bacteria that got in cells, have ruptured from those cells, and then have infected more cells. And then you, you can just carry on like that. So if we think about that first cohort, uh, where we've got N bacteria, we're going to make the assumption that these bacteria infect the cells very, very quickly at the start, so that our initial state can actually be N bacteria in phagosomes. And so these bacteria leave the phagosomes with rate phi. So all we're going to have for P1 is just this exponential decay. And so now if we think about the, the mean of the, well, if we think about our intracellular process, this is describing uh, the cytosolic replication of bacteria, but without that phagosomal stage. Um, so if we want to know the mean number of bacteria, or the size of this uh, C1, it's essentially just the mean of our intracellular process. Um, so we can give that here, but then we also account for a delay um, whilst the bacteria in the phagosome. And then the nice thing is that this, this mean was defined um, using the density of the time into rupture, so you can get quite a simple expression for the size of your first cohort. So then you can just go on and consider higher order cohorts. So we're going to define this, this function Rn, which is essentially our F tilde, so the, the function that's describing the release of bacteria, um, but it's going to be for the nth cohort that accounts for the delay um, in the phagosome and from the previous cohorts. And then when you think about what's happening for Pn, so we'll gain bacteria um, from them being released in the previous cohort, and then we'll lose them because they escape the phagosome. So we get a simple equation here. And then again, for CNRT, it's similar to what was on the previous uh, page. So this F is coming from the mean of our intracellular process. And you can carry this on um, for higher order cohorts. Uh, the only restriction is that the assumption we're making uh, is that each cell is only infected by a single bacteria. Uh, so generally, this will be true for the first few cohorts, but once you get so many extracellular bacteria, that's probably not going to be as likely. Um, to model the, the size of the cohorts in the remaining organs, uh, we first need this equation for the number of extracellular bacteria. So in this case, it will just be uh, the release of bacteria from the N cohorts that we're looking at, and then minus this term. So this would just be M times rho would be uh, uh, infecting again in the lung, gamma would be migration, and mu e would be some extracellular death. And so when you, you come to form the equations for the remaining organs, they have a very similar structure to the ones here. Um, again, we're going to make the assumption that given the time that it takes uh, for a cell to rupture, to become infected and rupture in the lung, um, we're going to say that within the first 48 hours of infection, there wouldn't be enough time for that cell to then go to another organ, uh, cause a the cell there to rupture, and then carry on infecting. So we're just going to restrict ourselves to looking at a single cohort, so just P1 and C1 in the remaining organs. Uh, and on the right here, you can see uh, these are comparisons between these approximation, approximations for the, uh, the first three cohorts against the agent-based simulations as well. So they seem to match well. So before we go on and do the, the parameter inference, um, what we always like to do is do some sensitivity analysis. Um, and the method we use here is a global method called the Sobel method. Um, and this is just looking at how your model output variance reduces when you fix parameters. So generally, you, there's, there's two quantities that you would define when you have this Sobel method. The first is the, the first order index, which is like a main effects term. And that will tell you how you, so the contribution to your variance from single parameter. Um, but sometimes the more informative one is this, this total index, which is plotted here. Um, so this is uh, the contribution to the, to the variance from that parameter and interactions between that parameter with others. Uh, so when we look at what the most important parameters are during the first 48 hours, we see that so beta seems to be highly important. And also of increasing importance is, is delta as well. Um, and then, again, this is also true when we look at other organs as well. So beta is perhaps obviously important because it's dictating how fast the bacteria population is growing. Um, for delta, the idea is that if you have a, well, you can think of delta as being like a delay in the continuous growth. So these ruptures are delaying the continuous growth of the, of the bacteria population. So if you have 
a large value of delta, i.e. the macrophages are rupturing very, very quickly, then there's not much time for these bacteria to actually escape the phagosomes and start replicating uh, before the macrophage ruptures and halts that process. Um, so yeah, so large, large values of delta would give you uh, quite different results to these smaller values. So with that, we can then go on and look at doing this uh, parameter inference in a Bayesian setting. So we use approximate Bayesian computation to do this. And for this, we're just looking at what we've uh, defined as the most important parameter. So in this case, uh, beta, delta, and this product, m times rho. And then also the parameters that we know the least about. So in this case, gamma, so the migration rate. And here we're considering the product m times rho uh, because it's not exactly clear what the value of m would be here. So I don't think it would necessarily be the number of macrophages in the lung. Um, it would be more like the number of macrophages in the localized areas of infection where the bacteria have reached. So for this ABC, we've set some prior distributions uh, just to be uh, uniform distributions to represent um, that we don't know much about these parameters. Um, and then we use this distance to compare. So these, this will be our model predictions. Um, and we'll compare to that uh, experimental data provided by DSTL. Um, and then we're also going to account for the variability in that data. And so when we do that, uh, these are the, the histograms that we get. So the nice thing is that we're learning a lot, a lot, uh, a lot about beta, which is our uh, intracellular replication rate. And more importantly, this was the most important parameter that we identified from the sensitivity analysis. Uh, for M rho and gamma, we get this high correlation, which is kind of expected. So M rho um, is really determining whether a bacterium will reinfect in the lung. And so gamma is telling you whether it will migrate away from the lung. So you can imagine that if you increase both of these quantities, you'll get the same, the same output. Um, and so you can't see it too well. So there are, there are shaded regions um, on these plots as well. So these are point-wise median predictions um, using the parameters from the ABC to then compare back to the data. Uh, so generally, it compares quite well um, to, the, to the lung. And then also, uh, for the other organs, we're getting that the, the lymph node is the highest again. And I should say so here. Um, so we had some weights, WJ, for which organ uh, the bacteria are more likely to migrate towards. So these were just estimated by looking at the data and looking at which, considering the proportion of bacteria that were going to each organ. So in that sense, you would kind of expect that we get the right ordering here. When we come to the, the distribution for delta, what you see is that really all we can learn um, just from the data alone is that it can't be high values. And this goes back to the, the point where if you have high values, you have very short rupture times. Um, whereas if you have uh, so slower rupture times, it doesn't really matter how slow it is. Once you're past sort of 24 hours, um, that's enough time for the bacteria to replicate such that that 15 minute delay whilst it's in the phagosome doesn't have much effect. Um, but how could, we, how could we refine this distribution? Well, from our, uh, so our birth catastrophe process, which is our intracellular model, we can get this expression for the, the mean time until rupture. And so this just depends on, on beta, our intracellular replication rate, and delta, our rate of rupture. And so the nice thing is, because we learned a lot about beta in our ABC, maybe we can use this uh, to try and refine the distribution of delta. So if you go right back to the start where we had the log normal distribution on the time until rupture, uh, what we did was take the mean of that distribution and allow for a bit of variability either side to it. And from our posterior sample from our ABC, we just chose the parameters um, that gave you uh, so a, mean, a mean rupture time close to that value. And so if you do that, you can actually refine uh, your posterior distribution for delta quite nicely. Um, and then again, so here, I should say as well that in the ABC, we didn't use all of the data. We didn't use the high and the medium dose. But, sorry, we only used the high and the medium dose, not the low dose. Um, just because it, don't know how informative it is because there aren't very many points here. Um, but if we go back and just use uh, the posterior distribution for our ABC and plot against this low initial dose data, 
we can see that, at least for the lung, it seems to, to compare fairly well. Um, but yeah, so th there was this green point up here is actually for the lymph node, um, which seems a bit odd. So it, this is even higher than what you get in the high initial dose data. So we'll just focus on the lung. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say uh, for today. <laughs> um, so yeah, so what we talked about is, is two approaches that we can uh, model uh, the intracellular life cycle of these, this bacteria, uh, Francisella tularensis. So the first one was when we, we know the distribution of rupture times, perhaps from experimental data, um, and we can use a phase type approximation to approximate that distribution if it's not an exponential or an Erlang or, or something related to, to the exponential. Um, we can use first step analysis to then describe how many bacteria are being released from the cell. Um, the alternative approach was to actually derive this time until rupture using the rates of the, uh, so what's a birth death catastrophe process or just our intracellular process. Um, and so in that case, yeah, we can get the, the distribution of rupture times as well as the release of bacteria as a function of time. Uh, and then we've applied what we know about that intracellular life cycle to actually model the early stages of uh, French cellular tulensis infection. And then by comparing to this in vivo data, we've managed to do some parameter inference. And so the nice the final thing about this is that um, when you look in the literature for um, estimates of this replication rate, they say that it's approximately six hours or so. Um, so actually our estimate of 0.15 seems to match up very well to that. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>